when we meditate, we're creating an island for ourselves in the middle of a big, fast-flowing river. This is our refuge. The Buddha says when you develop the establishings for mindfulness, you're making yourself your island, you're making the Dharma your island. It's your way station to get across the river. It gives you a safe place in the meantime before you reach the other side. And the Buddha doesn't make a clear distinction between mindfulness practice and concentration practice. In fact, you focus on the establishings of mindfulness. And those are the themes of right concentration. You stay with them, instead of the body in and of itself, as your ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference for the world. The mind gets more and more absorbed in the body. The breath, for instance, gives you a sense of solidity, so you're not constantly flowing away. Because that's the main image of the river. And the river here, of course, stands for craving. It keeps going someplace else. The water is never staying still in anywhere. It's moving on, moving on, moving on, and pulling you with it. If you try to find some safety, there's an image in the canon where the Buddha says it's like being swept down by a river. And there's grass and other plants on the bank of the river, and you try to grasp onto them and they tear away from your grasp. In other words, they get uprooted and they, you get pulled along with them, and many times they'll cut your hand. Some of the grasses the Buddha talks about are the kind that if you try to hold onto them, they just slice into your hand. Of course, the grasses are nourished by the river, the water of the river. The grasses here stand for the aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, metal fabrications and consciousness, not the senses. We try to grab onto these things, find some place to rest. Because as the Buddha said, it's only when there's peace, when there's a sense of resting, the mind has any real happiness. And yet this is all that river can grow, is these grasses that pull away and cut into your hand. I was reading recently a nature writer that I usually like. She tends to bring a lot of not only poetic sensitivity, but a lot of science to her writing. But she was writing at one point, she was reflecting on various ways of looking at, looking at the day at dawn. And one day she happened to notice two little dead birds. And she talked about how little they had seen and how sad it was in one sense. But then she started thinking about birddom as a whole. And she said it was like skin. Skin keeps creating new layers. The old layers slough off, but new layers keep coming. And she ended up with saying that it's empathy that makes it possible and love that makes it worthwhile. I suppose you could try to tell that to little birds and see if they felt it was worthwhile that they had to die as part of this sloughing off process. I mean, it's one thing to be skin cells and being sloughed off, but to be a living being and to be treated so cavalierly by nature. And the question is, is it really worthwhile? And is it empathy that makes it happen? As the Buddha said, it's craving that makes it happen, and it's inevitably going to cause suffering. In other words, it's not worth it. If you see the skin as having some larger purpose, then you have to put up with things. As the Buddha said, the universe doesn't have a larger purpose. We don't have to keep coming back. We don't have to keep following the craving and trying to grab onto something that's going to be of some rest, some respite, some refuge for us. We have the freedom to say, we want out. This is all that craving can create. It creates these things that give us a little bit of foothold, a little bit of a handhold, but not much. And inevitably, they've got to end. There's always going to be that suffering involved. So when we see that it is suffering, and that it's not worth it. This is another passage, or another theme she had was that we have to put up with the suffering, because otherwise we wouldn't be involved in life's great adventure. As well, the Buddha said, the bigger adventure is finding a way out. To understand the craving, to understand the cause of the craving. 
to learn how to grow it so that we're not slaves to it. We're not being constantly swept along. So it's good to think about what the Buddha said about the cause of suffering. He says it's the craving that leads to further becoming. Now becoming here is based on desire, this little kernel of a desire around which we create a sense of who we are and the world that's relevant to that desire. Say that you have a desire for chocolate. And there's a world that's relevant to that desire to chocolate, and there's a world that's not relevant. A lot of things in the world at that moment are totally irrelevant to the desire, and they get blotted out. And then your sense of you as the person who was going to enjoy the chocolate, and the sense of you as the person who's going to be able to get the chocolate and eat it. And all the aspects of you that are relevant to that, those go into that particular level of becoming. And then either you gain the object of your desire or you don't. Sometimes when you gain the object, you move on to something else. And even when you don't gain it, you decide, well, maybe there's something better I can have or something else I could attain. And so you drop that level of becoming and you create another one. But it's always based on craving. It keeps pulling you in this direction. This can happen on the level of sensuality, sensual desires, what they call form desire, the desire to state of form, i.e. like we're doing right now, inhabiting the body from the inside. That's called form. Once you get the mind into deeper stages of concentration, that's formless. This all can be a state of becoming. And it's based on craving. The literal translation for craving is thirst. And the Buddha goes on to say these states of becoming come from the craving that is accompanied by delight and passion, nandiraga. Or in John, John Sweat's simplification, he says, it's the things we like. These cause suffering. As we go for them, it's the desire we have for them. Delighting now here, now there. That now here, now there, that's the aspect of craving that keeps moving on, moving on. Creating little spots, creating little worlds through its desires that we then inhabit. As the Buddha said, there are three kinds of craving. There's craving for sensuality. That's our fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. Notice it's not so much the objects that are the problem. That's our fascination with thinking about this is the sensual pleasure I would like, and we can fantasize about it and create all kinds of stories around it. And that leads to suffering. Because there's always a hunger there. And to get sensual pleasures, they don't just come your way. You've got to go out and fight other people for them. Because the nature of sensual pleasures is that they're based on objects or people or relationships that you gain, somebody else has to lose. Or they gain, you lose. There's a constant struggle, constant conflict. And the mind gets weaker and weaker. It has to have this pleasure, it has to have that pleasure. The more you depend on the environment to be just so, the weaker you become. This pulls the mind down. Then there's craving for becoming itself. We like to take on certain identities. There's a self-image that we enjoy. Or being this particular person who's mastered these skills and gaining what he or she wants. And it can range from a wide range of things. But that too is going to lead to the kind of grasp that you try to grasp as the cravings sweeps you along and it's going to get pulled out of the bank or it's going to tear your hands. Because these identities can't last. And finally, there's the craving for no becoming. That's the paradoxical one. You would think that the craving for no becoming would be something that would put an end to becoming, but actually to put an end to becoming directly, you have to take on an identity as the destroyer of becoming. That becomes your new identity. 
it would seem to have you trapped, but that's what Buddha said. There's a way out. Instead of trying to put an end to things or trying to hold on to things, he says you learn how to watch them coming, and then you don't weave them any further. He uses John Lee's terms. In other words, you put the mind into a state of concentration like we're trying to do now. This is your island in the river. It is a state of becoming. You're inhabiting the body from within. There's a desire to get the mind to settle down. But it's strategic, because as you master this type of becoming, seeing the stages of what's involved in getting the mind to focus on one object and keep it there, you come to understand the all the processes around becoming more and more. Now your sense of who you are as a meditator depends on the body and on the mind. And your work with the energies in the body, your work with the events in the mind, this helps you to see the process of becoming more and more clearly. And as you learn how to pull out of distractions, that too helps you to understand the process of becoming. You get quicker and quicker at seeing the stages of how a little stirring comes right at the boundary between what's mental and what's physical. And then you slap a label on it, and you have to look at, well, what kind of craving was behind that label I placed on this? Can you catch the process more and more quickly? So even just trying to get the mind to settle down and dealing with distraction, you're learning something about becoming right there. And then when the mind is really settled in, then you can use that settled mind to see more clearly how the process of becoming happens and how you can just let it go. In other words, something comes up and you don't have to continue with it. The raw material comes in from your past karma, but you don't make it into present karma. That's simply seeing things as they have become, and that's it. You don't get involved in the further becoming. There's a sense of dispassion that comes when you see this, and because it was your passion that kept it going, that delight and passion that accompany the craving, that's what keeps the process of fabrication going. When you no longer feel any hunger or thirst to do these things, they stop with their own, because you're the one who's been doing them through your passion. And then they stop. Whether you're having to go out and put a stop to them, you just stop the causes and the results stop. So this is the Buddha's analysis of why we suffer. You know, some, of, some of the terms are fairly abstract, but when you gain a sense of this process of becoming. And you can see the craving that keeps feeding it, and you see how it keeps sweeping you along, sweeping you along. At the very least, if you can say, it's not worth it. Love doesn't make it worthwhile. Empathy doesn't make it worthwhile. That's when you're beginning to get your head above water. As you come to meditate, this is when you get an island. You haven't crossed over yet, but at least you've got a safe place, something you can hold on to. That's not going to pull out of your grasp and not going to cut your hands. You get a place where you can stop and breathe and take stock of things. Because this is an important part of meditation, is it puts you in a position where you can step back from your cravings and regard them with less interest and less hunger, less of a compulsion to go along with them. You've got something else to hold on to that's firmer and safer. So make use of this. Try to develop this island. Because it's the only way to safety.